In this video, I will tell you about the fundamentals of wireless communication channels. This is a video recorded for the course Introduction to Mobile Networks and Services at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology. There are three components that determine a wireless communication channel. The transmit antenna, the wireless signal propagation over there, and the receive antenna. And all of these different parts determine the channel quality. So we can't just analyze one, we need to consider all three of them in order to understand how a wireless channel behaves. When it comes to antennas, an antenna is an electrical conductor or a system of conductors that is used both at the transmitter and at the receiver. At the transmitter, the antenna radiates electromagnetic energy into space. So in different directions, you get radio waves that are propagating. And at the receiver, the antenna collects electromagnetic energy from space. So signals arriving from different directions. In two-way communications, so when you transmit and receive from the same antenna location, well, you can use the same physical antenna for both transmission and reception. So the hardware can be reciprocal in that sense. Here is a particular example. You have a base station deployed at the top of a building. And we have some different user devices that we want to reach. And in these scenarios, we might use different types of antennas. Maybe you are directing the signals down from the top of the building towards the user with a directive antenna that is pointing most of the energy in certain directions so that you know where the users are with respect to the base station's location. While the user device might not want to have a directive antenna because we want the mobile phone to be possible to be rotated in whatever way we like. So it can always pick up signal energy from wherever we are because in some cases the signal is propagating in very complicated ways from the transmitter to the receiver. So these principles apply to the transmit and receive antenna. What about the wireless propagation between the transmitter and the receiver? Well, there are three important phenomena that are appearing. The first one is known as the geometric path loss. So the signals are spreading out in different directions and in that way they become thinner and thinner in each direction. So view it a bit like you have a balloon that you're blowing up and the outer part of that one is getting thinner and thinner the further away you are from the transmitter or the center of this balloon. So if we put a base station at the center of an area, which is 500 by 500 meters, well then the further away you are, the weaker the signal is going to be just because you are further away and the signal energy is spreading out. And that typically leads to that your bit rate in megabit per second in a communication system will become weaker and weaker as you are moving away. So this is the geometric path loss that is always happening because of wave propagation. Then if you take a particular area and zoom in on it, in addition to these global trends, we might also have fast variations called small scale fading, which can be very rapid. So in small distances at the order of the wavelength, we can have path loss variations. So variations in loss that are many tenths of the B. So maybe we only all of a sudden receive a hundred part of what we would have here at the average. But sometimes it could also be larger than it would be on the average. And finally, if we are putting big objects into the propagation environment, which we typically are, well then for the signals to go through a big wall, we might lose another 10 to 20 decibels. So a large fraction of it is not going through the wall. And this is known as shadowing. In this video, we will focus on this geometric path loss. So let us consider a very simple scenario, free space path loss or attenuation where we have a transmit antenna at a particular location and the signal is spreading out so that it is at the surface area of a sphere. And when the receive antenna is at a particular distance, D, away from the transmitter, the receiver have a certain area, AE. It stands for area effective, and we will come back to that in a moment. Well then, in order to figure out what fraction of the transmitted power that makes it to the receiver, we should compare how large the receive antenna is in area compared to the surface area of a sphere with its radius d, which is 4 pi d square. And we will express this loss factor here, L 4 pi d square over the effective area, as the path loss. 
and we can then write that the received signal power is the transmitted power divided with the puff loss. And let me give you a concrete example when we use isotropic antennas. These are particular kinds of antennas, hypothetical ones, that are radiating signals equally much in all directions. It doesn't matter in which direction we are rotating them. And they happen to have an effective area, AE, which I now will denote as A iso for isotropic, which is lambda square over 4 pi. Lambda is the wavelength that the antenna is made for. Then the path loss that we are having for an isotropic antenna is 4 pi d square divided by this area of an isotropic antenna, which gives us this expression, 4 pi d over lambda and the whole thing is squared. And you might not get a good sense of how big or small this value is, but we can get that by considering a particular wavelength, 0 0.1 meters, which is representing 3 gigahertz, which is very common in 5G. And then we consider a propagation distance of one meter, so very close to the transmitter. And if you compute these numbers, you will see that L is 42 decibels. So that means that roughly you take the energy that is transmitted, you chop it up into 20,000 different pieces, and then one of them gets received. And if you are increasing the distance, to 10 meters, well then you have a squaring effect here, so you lose 100 times more. In decibels this means 62 decibels, which means that you take your transmit power, you divide it into roughly 2 million different pieces and only one of them is received. So we can see that in general, even at short distances, only a very tiny fraction of transmitted power gets received, even if we are only considering the geometric path loss. Is there anything we can do about this? Well, we could use directive antennas. So I was considering a particular type of area for the antenna on the previous slide, but we can use a large area, AE, and in that way we'll have a higher maximum gain. However, this is always leading to that we have a directional transmission. The larger the antenna is, the more the antenna gets directive in a particular direction. And now it also becomes important that we are talking about effective areas. An antenna will have a physical area, and then it has an effective area, which is how big it looks like from the viewpoint from where the signal is propagating or where it's received from. And that one is typically smaller than the physical area. So here is an example about antenna gains. This is how directive or how strong an antenna is compared to an isotropic antenna. So we take the effective area of the antenna that we actually are having, we divide it with the effective area of an isotropic antenna, and remember that one was lambda square over 4 pi, so this is a factor that we call the antenna gain. This is how much stronger the antenna is. And we often report these things in terms of dB scale like this. And it's dB with respect to an isotropic antenna, which is why it's called dBi. Here is an example of an antenna gain for a particular antenna. We can see that at the back side of this globe here, it is white, which means that there's actually no signal propagating there. This is an antenna that is only sending out signals into half of the world, the ones that it's on the left hand side here. Then we, there is a scale from minus 6 to plus 6 dBi. So black means that we have 6 dB or 4 times stronger signals than an isotropic antenna. And this is happening in this direction. And then you can see a progression towards the red where it's equally strong as an isotropic antenna to yellow towards the side where it's weaker. So this antenna is focusing signals in this direction and sends less in other directions. So what happens then with the path loss when we have directive antennas? Well, for example, the transmitter is focusing the signal so more of it is showing up in the direction of the receiver and the receiver might be larger, so it also captures a bigger fraction of the transmitted power. We can define a transmitter gain of the antenna, and once again it's the effective area of transmitter in the direction that leads towards the receiver, divided with the area of an isotropic antenna. And the receiver antenna gain towards the transmitter, it is the effective area of the receiver in the direction that the transmitter sees, divided with the area of a isotropic antenna. So remember we had this free space path loss formula for isotropic antennas. 
when we would like to figure out what is the path loss with directive antennas, well, we take this one and we divide with the gains for at the transmitter and at the receiver. And we can write this in a couple of different forms like this or that, depending on if we are writing an expression that depends on the gains or the areas of the antennas. So now we're coming back to the claim I made on the first slide, namely that the channel quality or the path loss in this case depends both on the propagation channel and on the antennas. So on the propagation channel, we have the distance and that is determining the loss over there, while the gain of transmitter and receive antennas is also coming into the path loss here. And we can't decouple them. We need to make assumptions about distances, wavelength and transmit to receive antennas. We can see that the path loss expression depends on the wavelength. So if we are reducing the wavelength, which means going up in frequency, well then, if we keep the gains of the transmitter and receiver fixed, we have this expression here. And a smaller wavelength means a larger path loss. So going up in frequency with fixed gain antennas leads to larger path loss, so a worse channel quality. However, if we are keeping the areas fixed when we are changing the wavelength. Well, then we're using this expression instead, which is not dependent on the gains, but the areas. And now we can see that the gains is increasing when we are reducing the wavelength. We divide with the wavelength here. And this means that the path loss is shrinking when we are making the wavelength smaller. So we get a smaller path loss at higher frequencies. So any study of the quality of the channel needs to consider the propagation channel and the antennas and the wavelength. One of the issues, of course, with having directive antennas is that the signal is only strong in a particular direction. So if we are rotating the antenna in the wrong direction, well, then we get a weak signal. But there is a solution to this issue called antenna rays, which can create adaptive directivity. So suppose we have two transmit antennas here. They are sending out signals at the same time, the same signals, and we can see the green wave fronts here are sent at the same time, the gray at the same time, and so on. And over the air, these waves will now interact with each other, and they will create constructive and destructive interference patterns. In this case, you can see that they are aligned up in this direction, which means that we will get constructive interference upwards here. So the signal will reinforce each other in that direction. This means that if these two antennas are not having any particular directivity to start with, so they're sending out the signals equally strong in all directions. Then if you put two of them here and we are measuring the signal strength at the same distance, but in different directions, we will notice that we get a strong signal upwards and weaker signals to the sides. So by using two antennas with the same signal, we create directivity just because of the constructive and destructive interference. We can also now control the directivity by varying what we are sending out from the two antennas. So same two antennas, but we are delaying the signal on the second antenna here, so we send it out later. We can now see that the signals are aligned in this direction. We will get constructive interference upwards to the right here. And that means also that if we are measuring the signal strength in different angular directions, we will see that it's strong upwards in this direction and weak in many other directions where we have destructive interference. So we send the same signals from the two antennas, but with different delays. And that is then making sure that we can control the directivity. So essentially, it is like we are rotating physically the antenna array so that we are pointing the beam upwards here, but we are not rotating anything. We are instead just delaying the signals or phase shifting them so we can control the activity in the electrical way and not in a mechanical way. Base station antennas over the last few decades have evolved in this particular way. So in the beginning, we had big antennas that were having a fixed directivity and then we are generating the radio signals underneath the tower and we had a baseband unit that is creating the signals that is going to be radiated. Then later on, the radio unit became so small that we can put them next to the antenna in the tower. Still, we were having a passive antenna that was focusing the signals in a rather wide area focused uh, towards where all of the possible uses could be because we didn't want to risk missing anyone that we want to cover with our base station. 
And nowadays in 5G and beyond, we are using arrays of active antennas. So we have radius and small antennas in a big panel, and that allows us to direct the signals exactly where the users are. And we can therefore afford having a much stronger gain because we know that we will always put the signal where the receiver is, wherever the receiver is. And we are also seeing that the baseband unit, which is now still underneath the tower, could also be moved somewhere else because this is a fiber cable between the mast and the baseband unit. So with that, I would like to thank you for watching and I hope you have understood how a wireless channel is depending both on a transmit and receive antennas and on the propagation in between these antennas.